to Rendezvous with the Writer with Bobby Jean and Jim Bell, only on L.A. Talk Radio. Welcome to Ryan Move with Ryder, where readers and writers meet, uh, and, and story, story is everything. everything. We're your hosts tonight, Jim and Bobby Bell. And we're so happy you're with us. Yes, and you know, there's a little change in the music for tonight. Don't you love that? <laughs> what is that, Jim? Do you recognize what that music the is? The good, the bad, and the ugly. And the ugly. And it comes to <laughs> us courtesy of the Hot Texas Swing Band. They recently recorded it on their newest album, um, Devil on My Tail, and they have another brand new album coming mm. out this month. And we just thought that it was appropriate to open tonight's show because our featured guest is Henry, Henry C. C. Park, Park, film editor mm. of True West Magazine. You know that he's always with us the first Thursday of every month, but tonight, we are so honored to have him as our special guest yes. because he's the author of The, the Greatest, Greatest Westerns, Westerns Ever Made and The People Who Made, made them. them. And so it was just perfect to open with that music. Henry, hello, hello. Hello, and that was perfect opening music. I love that. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie Morricone. Yes, yes. It was very fun to switch things up a little bit. <laughs> Well, this book mm. released just this week. It did. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the, what, the day before yesterday, or was it even yesterday? Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday, yeah. Tuesday. Tuesday, February yeah. 6th. So right. what was it like for you on release day? Were you were you thinking about it all night the night before? Were you checking into Amazon all day, or was it just another day? <laughs> it was it was not just another day, but it's you know, it's my first book. Yeah. And I, I don't even know like how to respond. I'm just so excited. I've just been giggling like a schoolgirl for days. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a, it's a terrific book. It's a great book. Yes. Thank you. Um, Jim and I, of course, as we always do, we read it cover to cover, and I've been back through different parts of it. And um, and now that we have it in our hands, and it's so well written, and we're going to talk yeah. about that in a few more moments, but it's so engaging mm -hmm. that, Henry, mm -hmm. we are watching Western film. Yeah, we're in and we're doing lab work after <laughs> after hours. That's good. You we gotta, listen to Western music. Work. We read Western um fiction and nonfiction. We are Western lifestyle folks, but I don't know. The Western movie has never really spoken to us until now. Oh boy, if I can take credit for some of that, I'm I'm thrilled. Well, absolutely. And we kind of decided that using your book as our as our um, primer, prime primer, um, we're just going to what we're just going to follow it right in order. So the very first film we watched the other night was Stagecoach. And I know we're we, we have an intro for you and we're going to get into all of that in just a minute. But <laughs> we're excited, too. <laughs> so I'd seen it years ago. I had some memories of it, but. We read the chapter, of course, and then when we decided we were going to do this, we reread it. And then we had it like open. And then we're watching the movie, and I couldn't multitask. I don't know what's going to happen in my workload, Henry, because I multitask while I watch TV, and I can't multitask and watch a Western. <laughs> no, there so, are those are movies you actually have to watch. <laughs> Yeah. You really do. So, Jim, before we yeah. get farther astray, yes, let's... he has an intro for Henry, like we always do. Yeah, for all our folks in the audience, <laughs> absolutely. <clears throat> Brooklyn born, LA based writer and film historian Henry C. Park graduated from New York University School of Film and Television. He has been film and TV editor for True West, 
magazine since 2015. He has written Henry's Western Roundup, the online report on Western film production since 2010. His screenwriting credits include Speed Trap in 77 and Double Cross in 94. He's the first writer welcomed into the Western Writers of America for his work in electronic media. He's been married to his wife, Stephanie, for 30 years and their daughter, Sabrina. She's a documentary film producer. All right. Yes, so welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Henry. Thank you. So, oh, by the way, it's just uh, 38 years. Um, 38 there. years. Yeah. Oh, oh, how did we miss that? I don't know. I don't know. I Thank, you Thank you for the correction. Thank you for the correction. I don't well, have my daughter calling in saying, I'm over 30. What is this? <laughs> Good point. So uh, would you tell us, I, I think one of the things that we know sets your writing apart from so many others is because you have film background. Will you tell us a little bit about um, film school and, and how that impacted you? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, I don't think I've actually mentioned this to you, but I, I started out at a film workshop when I was 16 at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, run by the Young Filmmakers Foundation. And so I did that when I was 16. And when I was 17 or 18, I taught a film workshop for them. And then when I graduated from high school, uh, I went to NYU Film School and uh, was a film major. So that's that's really how I uh, started making student films and things yeah. like that. So you were behind the camera. You were learning all of the different, you know, when we watch screen credits and you see all the different um, grips and all the different things, you, you knew oh. and knew all of what that was all about. Oh, yeah. I've... Yeah. Uh, I've done camera work, uh, assistant camera work. I've been a dolly grip. Uh, I've done a lot of sound work. I've done editing, sound effects editing. Uh, I'm a, I've been a Foley stepper, which yeah. is the, where you, you make the sound effects in the studio to match the pictures on the screen. Oh, that's okay. what I know. New yeah. Foley had to do with that, but the stepper so that you're in. Oh, they call it a Foley stepping because most of what you're doing is matching people walking on screen to uh, sure. have it sound right. Right, right. And whether they so, have spurs yeah. on or not and all of that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and whether they're walking on gravel or sand or whatever. Yeah. Did you uh, act in any of the movies, any of your productions? I, you know, it's funny. In, in Speed Trap, uh, I have a very small role. At one point, <laughs> Joe Don Baker is... is uh, running down a street in Phoenix, Arizona, looking for a car thief. And if you see him go by uh, a woman of the night talking to two kids and one is saying, gee, $100 is a lot of money. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And she does say I'm a lot of woman. So, I mean, she gets the last word. Okay. Um, let's see. So... Yeah, you mentioned Speed Trap. So you you were involved in two two kind of important films and certainly important in your career. How did Speed Trap come about? Well, when I was NY at NYU, uh, and you know, like students do, looking to pick up extra money and extra work, uh, I uh, worked on a an animation film festival that was run at uh, the school, and I mean, I, as a ticket ripper and uh, you know, seat folder and things like that, nothing nothing to demanding but the man who ran it is, is a gentleman named fred mintz who uh has run animation festivals more or less as a hobby i, I think it was more that you know a, a matter of love rather than income but his main income uh was he would represent american company film companies overseas and foreign companies in the united states and try and get the right films to the right kind of people and he had been representing the 1970s version, not the not the recent one, Gone in 60 Seconds, which was mm -hmm. shot by a guy named Toby Haliki, a, a, a junk man uh, who did this film where he crashed hundreds of cars and, and made a fortune. And he kept looking at it and saying, we're doing so well and this is junk and we could do so much better with a good story. <laughs> and he, he had a story. He had a, a, the outline of a plot and um but he uh was romanian and his english was he could speak very well but he couldn't 
like write dialogue for Americans to say. He, he couldn't do the vernacular. And he told me his story and I wrote an outline and we ended up uh, scripting it together. And that's uh, how Speed Trap came came about. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Did you have a question? Well, you know, I have one down here. And I'm not sure where this question came from. <laughs> okay. It said something about hard boiled. Oh yeah. Henry. Oh yeah. So so you shared the other night that you're also known as hard boiled Henry. How would you get that moniker? Oh well, that's. Uh, <laughs> That's what Francis Dole uh, over at uh, what was then New World and then New Horizon uh, Pictures uh, nicknamed me. Um, she worked for Roger Corman for many years. And because the thing is, uh, most of my writing career, I've been a screenwriter most of my life, and most of it has been writing uh, crime-related stuff, film noirs mm -hmm. and things, not, um, not Westerns. I, I've been a comedy and film noir guy most of my life. Uh, but so hard boiled. I think that's the way we should introduce you from now. From now, I think I should get that on a business card. <laughs> so, so how did you, how did you get connected to the West? Well, it's a funny thing. I always, I always loved westerns, uh, but at the same time, uh, I for the longest time I didn't have the nerve to try and write one because I always thought, gee, I really. When I, it comes to comedy, I know how to be funny. When it comes to crime, uh, I've you know followed that genre all my life. I, I understand it. It's contemporary. But I didn't think I had a strong enough history background to write Westerns. Whereas I've since learned that most of the people uh, who write Westerns know so much less history than me. So I should be <laughs> intimidated all that time. But what, what happened is... Um, to have something to do other than just uh, writing screenplays, just, you know, stretch my brain a little. I wanted to create a website, a blog, and what I uh, settled on was writing about Westerns because I kept finding out about film festivals on the last day that they were occurring and missing events. And I thought there is no central uh, clearinghouse sort of for, for Western things. There are for all the other genres. So I just started this uh, blog henry's western roundup and mm -hmm. uh the idea was just to keep track of film festivals and and what what uh tv channels were running what shows and things like that and very quickly i started getting called by uh actors from spaghetti westerns and people making low budget westerns saying you know we'd like to talk to you about what we're doing and it just it blew up from there that's just so yeah. that's just so interesting. When did yeah. you when did you start writing that? What time? I started in 2010 yeah. in, in uh, 2010. Yeah. 2010. I think in January of 2010, so I've been doing it for 14 years. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, and I think I don't know technically mm -hmm. when blogs, you know, kind of became not commonplace, but suddenly, you know, just like vlogs and things and so mm -hmm. you probably also hit it at just like you just hit it at the right time. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, as I said, nobody will I always say to people is um, Western people are kind of anti-technology. So it it took a long time to get uh, people willing to to check out the whole, uh, you know, electronic world because it's so hard to balance a laptop on a saddle horn. <laughs> <laughs> You are funny. <laughs> how, how did you get to uh, Two West Magazine? Well, um, the way that came about, um, I had been writing Henry's Western Roundup for a few years, and I was the uh, first writer um, welcomed into the Western Writers of America uh, for his electronic writings. They actually had to change the rules uh, to let me in because you had to originally have a certain amount of books or articles published. Right. And when they brought me, uh, you know, when they let me go there, uh, it was there that uh, I started meeting people in, in the business, including uh, the uh, then editor of True West, Megan Saar. And um, uh, we were brought together by our mutual good friend, Courtney Joyner, of course, is a very accomplished yes. uh, Western screenwriter, yeah. novelist, and uh, you know, everything film and everything Western you can do, Courtney does better than most people. 
And he had been the uh, film editor for True West for, I think, three years. And happily, his screenwriting career picked up to a degree that he couldn't continue to do it. And he recommended me. And that's really how I ended up at True West. I'm just it's gonna great. I'm gonna hold it up. I'm gonna hold it up another another time here. This happens okay. to be the January, February issue. We're waiting for our next one. Um, how do you how do uh, the articles that you write, how do you get the lead how do you get the leads? Or do they do they provide leads for you or do you just kind of go like, oh, I think I want to write about how how does an article come about? Well, um, it's a couple of steps. Uh, I, I don't go ahead and write something without consulting them we tend to plot out at, at some point, we'll plot a year ahead and say, okay, we you know, need however many, six, 10, 12 articles and um, uh, you know, go through topics and figure out oh, things like, oh, it's the 30th anniversary of this film this year. That would be a good one to do. So we go by that, we go by new movies that are coming out, uh, just topics that are interesting sometimes it'll be just luck i'll meet somebody and, and say you know we could do an interview with this person or that person so sometimes i generate them uh, a lot of times they do and it's you know it's it's a collaborative thing mm -hmm. you know uh, <clears throat> you do a lot of interviewing uh, how do you um, how do you go about it? how do you prepare for an interview uh i do as much homework as humanly possible yeah. Um, I sit down and, uh, let's say I'm going to interview an a actor. I will watch, you know, if they've done a dozen Westerns, I'll try and watch okay. all of them. I'll make notes. Uh, and this is something that maybe is too extreme, but I tend to write, have a, a complete bunch of questions written and in front of me mm -hmm. before I call anyone and first ask for an interview. As a result, there are a number of people I've done a lot of prep with that I have not gotten to talk to at all. Mm -hmm. But but all too often, what will happen is you'll call somebody, and if they're in the mood, say, okay, sure, what do you want to know? And you need to be ready then. To be ready to go, right. Yeah. Do, do okay. you... Uh, time, yeah, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, what one time uh, I was uh, working on an article, and... Uh, uh, it was uh, for the Cowboys, the, the John Wayne picture. And the phone rang and I answered and the man started talking so immediately that I, I said, wait, wait, I'm sorry, who's this? And he says, is this Henry Park? I said, yeah. He says, and, and you're writing an article for True West about the Cowboys? I said, yeah. He says, well, this is Bruce Stern. <laughs> what did you want to know? <laughs> and I mean, I hadn't even called him yet. I didn't have his phone number, but it was a sort of a friend of a friend. I had mentioned that I was doing it, and somebody who knew his assistant mentioned it, and they mentioned it to him, and he called me. Oh so I was just so lucky that I was prepared. You know. It, wow. Wow. It was, sure. Like, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> so, do you take no? Are you when you are you yeah. often on the phone, or are you one on one? Uh, you know, in an office or at a table? Do you take notes? Do you record? Kind of. How do you capture that interview? Um, well, sometimes it's in person, sometimes it's uh, over the phone, probably more over the phone than in person, because that way you don't have to be in the same city and so on. It's always more fun when you can do it face to face. And and I'll say when I did Bruce Dern face to face, we had lunch for four and a half hours. Oh. And it was wonderful. We just had so much fun. And we're going to um, talk about him in a little bit. No, go ahead. Go ahead. But uh, yeah, it's uh, but I record everything. I'm you do. not that great a note taker. I record it all. I have it electronically transcribed. Okay. Um, oh, roughest interview I, I think I ever remember doing was uh, with Johnny Crawford uh, mm -hmm. from the Rifleman. It was a was a great guy, and uh, he said, "Yeah, why don't you know come down? We'll have have lunch and and you know went to a Mexican restaurant in his neighborhood and it was great." But what we didn't realize was it was Fiesta Day <gasps> and the music never stopped. And my gosh, was that a nightmare to transcribe? Oh my gosh. It was worth it, but it was not oh. easy. Well, um, Henry, we're going to take, a, I know we're already running a little over our outline, but it's just so darn fun. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take our first quick break and we're going to hear about where you can, one of the places you can get Henry's book, as well as all of the titles from our guests of Rendezvous with a Writer. And when we come back, it's all about the book. Stay tuned.
Story is everything. Find a great one on OutWest Shop's bookshop. Go to outwestshop.com. Find books and CDs on the menu. Choose Shop Out West on bookshop.org. Browse through featured authors on Rendezvous with a Writer. Explore curated book lists and our featured picks. Add in note cards, calendars, and jigsaw puzzles. One-stop shopping for great gifts. Use the search box to find thousands more titles. Make the switch. Your purchase supports us as independent booksellers. That's our story. Welcome back. Welcome back to the Money Over the Writer. Our special guest tonight, Henry Park. And That's we're talking me. about his brand new book, The Greatest Lessons Ever Made. And, and the, the people, people who made, who made them. them. <laughs> you know, we kind of have a question speaking of lessons. Do you see a resurgence in that art? A resurgence in that art? In uh, the, yes, I, I absolutely do. I think that um, it, it's funny because when. I don't think I mentioned that uh, this book is based on my True West articles, about 80 of them. And so going back and rereading everything that I wrote for like nine years, trying to choose articles, I was stunned by how often I say, this is proof that Westerns are coming back. And, you know, it's it's something where we hear all the time that um, they're not dead, they're coming back. But it really uh, is, I think, remarkable how much Western stuff uh, is out there uh, these days. And uh, I think Taylor Sheridan's success has a great deal to do with that, that he has made the West chic and cool again. Mm -hmm. Uh, So just the the number of of, uh, films that are uh, in production and released in the last few years, uh, the number of series on, uh, you know, both uh, cable and, you know, regular channels, it's, it's terribly encouraging. Because mm-hmm. I've got a lot of scripts, so <laughs> nice. Well, that's, that's true. Uh, there in in Western film, um, it seems as though there are some themes that run not with every one of them, but kind of the as the um, the idea of redemption um, yeah. seems to play a role. Do you, is that right? Do you, have you picked that up in all mm. of your years of watching film? Oh, yes, absolutely. It's um, uh, one of the core themes of Westerns. It's, it's funny, actually, one year, I'm going back about 10 years, there were like five films that were released in, in a year that all had redemption in the title. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah. it's yeah. about people being able to sort of <laughs> fix their mistakes and, and remake their lives. In the, in the interview that you do with Bruce Dern, um, no, I'm not sure it was with uh, Bruce Stewart. No, it was. Um, it doesn't matter. You were writing about the Magnificent Seven, the new, the new version of it. Yes. And you make a comment that I thought was um, so true, and really, in even in literature, a hero can only be as heroic as his villain is formidable. And I was watch. We were watching um, the original John Wayne True Grit last night, and then we followed it with with High Noon. And um, in a, and we're not really going to talk about High Noon except for so we never see the villain. He just gets talked about, and all the tenseness leading up. He's coming to town. He's coming to town. Mm-hmm. We get to see the Marshall Kane. We get to kind of see how he acts in the community, and we get to see what kind of guy he is. But that villain is. It's we're so tense. You know, <laughs> and he doesn't show up until, you know, the very end. And I thought, oh, that is that's such a telling comment that you added in your the thing about that. I love about your writing, Henry, is you're 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 giving us the interviews and you're bringing out such great information in your interview technique with your with your um, people that you're talking to. But you're also sharing your own insights and you share with us the filmmaker's eye we you share with us we're we're watching the film through your lens of being a filmmaker rather than being a historian or a film historian and i don't mean to discredit that but it gives such a liveliness your chapter on stagecoach and we just get into stagecoach Mm -hmm. because you talk about yakima kanut and then you talk about him later and he makes appearances throughout the right. book. 
But when we got to that scene in Stagecoach where the stagecoach is going to cross the river and, you know, go to the ferry. And I thought if we hadn't read what you had to say about Stagecoach, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have necessarily realized what went on right there. And it doesn't take away from, I don't suddenly feel like, oh, now I'm watching a movie and this is how they did that. It's more like, that's amazing that they were able to do that. <laughs> Speaking of stagecoach, uh, <clears throat> would you want to say a line or two about it? Because I'm yeah. sure there's a lot of people listening or watching tonight never saw that Yeah, we'll just shut up and let you talk about stagecoach. I, I always say that stagecoach is the Citizen Kane of Westerns. And the, the irony is that Orson Welles watched stagecoach like 30 times before he made Citizen Kane. He thinks it's, uh, or thought it was the Citizen Kane of movies. It's... Uh, yeah. To me, it's it's just a, as near to a perfect film as I can think of. It remar remarkable. And that whole, I think you say it's six minutes. I always, almost want to go back and watch it again in just time. That that whole amazing, that whole amazing, whatever you want to call it, not fight scene, but. Oh, the, oh, the, the, uh, the stagecoach chase on the flats. Chase, yes. Oh, that's amazing. And I just. You Love that Yakima Kanut was doubling for everyone. Everyone. It, it, so you know he's uh, he's up on the on the top as as John Wayne, and uh, then he's shooting uh, himself as an Indian, trying to you know cut the horses loose, and he's the one going under. It, it's just yeah, it's it was amazing. He, I think we talk about him being the best, or the greatest stuntman of all time. So yeah, yeah. Um, um, that was 1939, and there were a lot of important films in 1939, weren't there? Oh, yeah. A lot of people would uh, would consider, and I, I think I'm on that list, would say 1939 was the greatest film year. Mm -hmm. um, be, you know, you have Gone with the Wind and Wizard of Oz. <laughs> you know, what more do you need? Right. That's true. Um, right. Can we... Uh, yeah. Do you want to uh, move on? Yeah. Ahead. We want to yeah. ask about... Let's compare the Wild Bunch and Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. Yeah, we'll move to 1969. Because <laughs> you covered the, you did a lot of talk about this in your book, you know. And uh, yeah, that was, it's a, a remarkable thing because there in 1969, uh, two of our, I think, greatest Westerns were made the same year uh, and about the same people. And I, the point of view of the two films are different enough that I think a lot of people, have seen both and maybe even know them pretty well and don't realize that they are both the story of, of the same wild bunch that Butch Cassidy yeah. and the Sundance Kid are uh, uh, William Holden and Ernest Borgnine. Mm -hmm. Henry, how important is it? How close does a movie need to be to the truth? and Or does that even matter? I you know, I don't think it matters unless you're going to say it's the truth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think the you know you you have to entertain an audience, and and that's that's crucial. But of course, you know it's it's a balance. There are films that are purely entertainment that are purely fiction, and uh, there are ones that uh, really uh, tell historical stories. Well, I I think it's important to sort of hit a, a balance between those mm -hmm. um, because it's important to know the truth, mm -hmm. but it's also important to stay awake. <laughs> <laughs> so the outlaw Josie Wales, yes. 1976. You want to talk a little bit about this one? Oh yes. That, that's quite a picture. And boy, has that been imitated? Uh, you know, a lot, it has influenced an awful lot of films awful lot of revenge stories of a uh, cowboy whose family is killed and he spends the rest of the movie tracking down and killing the guys who did it. And the thing that I think is too bad is that people miss the heart of it. That That is not the whole film that, um, as you were saying before, Jim, about redemption, yeah. that uh, he gets beyond that and, and has a new life and does important stuff after that. And of course, one of the, the, the fascinating things about that, that whole story um, of the book, Josie Wales, uh, is that it was uh, 
written by, oh gosh, uh, the last name is Forrest. He wrote a, a book called The Education of Little Tree about his upbringing uh, by Cherokee parents, uh, grandparents, when his parents died. And it was uh, used to be uh, required reading in lots and lots of schools. And as he became more famous uh, and successful, he sort of did himself in because it turned out that not only was it pure fiction, and this was not his autobiography, but he was in fact, uh, had been a uh, major officer in the Ku Klux Klan and wrote speeches for George Wallace and had been uh, more or less a terrible ter person in his time. Mm -hmm. um, and he redeemed himself. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately it didn't redeem his career once it came out, but, uh, you know, wrote these wonderful stories, uh, just just full of heart and decency, and yeah, that's an so story. interesting. Now, did Clint Eastwood end up directing? Yes, that he did. okay. Right. And, is, and how, so, how so? What happened there? How that happened? Well, no, uh, <laughs> what happened, and I, the the fellow who directed. Uh, started directing the film, was a very talented guy, but uh, worked a very different way from uh, Clint. And I should say that this is what Sandra Locke told me, um, that he was a, a very good and careful director and uh, took his time. And Clint is not that kind of a filmmaker. He knows what he wants uh, and he gets it and he knows how to get what he wants in a couple of takes and then moves on. So he was going crazy at the pace that the movie was moving. And he was the producer, uh, you know, his company, Mal Paso. So what happened after a few days is he fired the director and took over the direction himself. And uh, as a result, uh, the writer's guild kind of went nuts. Over, excuse me, the director's guild went nuts over this. And there is now the Eastwood rule, which says essentially... <laughs> Yeah, if if you are you know starring in a movie and you don't like how the director is doing it, you are not allowed to fire him and take his job. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, we're going to take our second very quick break, and when we're going to come back, let's talk a little bit about um, at least one of the stars you write about, Robert Duvall. We're going to be right back in just a moment. Stay tuned. Right here at the Out West Shop, we're passionate about the American West, the truth and the myth. We're purveyors of fine Western goods. We scout for unique and distinctive apparel, accessories, home decor, and general merchandise that are a reflection of the Western lifestyle. We hunt for unique artisans and craftsmen who are inspired to create decorative art you can wear based on their own love for the story of the West. We round it up and bring it to you. Check out outwestshop.com when you need anything Western. Welcome back. Welcome back oh, to Writer Room and Writer. I'm sitting here reading. <laughs> Special guest tonight, Henry Park. <laughs> you know, we were talking, we're about ready to talk about, ask you a question about Robert Duvall. But you mentioned Sandra Locke, and I know you had an interview or two with her. Uh, yes, I did. Um, and she was she was very nice about it. Uh, it's, it's funny. Um, I don't. I never met her face to face. We talked several times yeah. on the phone and it was not too long before she passed away. So I'm not sure if she might've been in not great health, but she was not very enthused about wanting to give an interview. And the way I got her to give her an interview was uh, to tell her that we, if not, if we hadn't actually worked together, we'd been working at the same time in the same place because uh, when she was uh, in Phoenix, Arizona with Clint Eastwood shooting a film called The Gauntlet, uh, I was in Phoenix as uh, I had written a film called Speed Trap, which was being done with uh, Joe Don Baker and Tyne Daly. And there was a third film shooting there, which uh, oddly enough, because uh, we're all at the same little Ramada Inn. Uh, and Oliver Reed was there doing a, a, a film called Assault on Paradise. And so you could walk into this sort of funky little Ramada and go into the bar and there would be uh, Clint Eastwood and Joe Don Baker and Oliver Reed and all these actors. Uh -huh. uh, it was uh, kind of an amazing thing. But um, 
actually one time while we were there uh, and you know people were always coming up to the stars and asking for autographs they were all very nice about it and a girl came up and asked Clint Eastwood for an autograph but she didn't have a piece of paper and she said no my arm and he shrugged okay and he wrote Clint <laughs> longer arm the next day uh when the Phoenix newspaper came out on the cover was the girl showing her arm she had gone straight to a tattoo parlor and had it etched into her arm and Clint was so horrified that uh he wouldn't sign anything the whole rest of the shoot but uh anyway i was i was able to uh tell that story in an email to sandra Locke and sort of prove that yeah we you were really, in the same yeah. area and after that she uh very kindly gave me a, a a very long and detailed interview. Oh, yeah, that <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. it's that's just so. It's just so. It's so interesting. Mm -hmm. All of the people. You're if you still have a Rolodex, it just has to be bulging. <laughs> you might. <laughs> I got stacks and, uh, of index cards and business index cards. cards so yeah. disorganized. So um, you have in the book. There is the first chapter is called I think classic movies. It's really wonderful how your table of contents is set up. And that chapter one, we talked about a couple of the films from that classics chapter. And then you get into chapter two, the stars, mainly film. And there's a lovely, you know, list of them. So Robert Duvall is, just happens to be the first name there. Do you want to talk a little bit about Robert oh, Duvall? Absolutely. Because uh, he was uh, one of my absolute favorite interviews. Uh, he was... Uh, just so um, enthusiastic. The, the way it came up uh, was we were coming up on a Lonesome Dove anniversary. I can't remember how many years it was, but uh, he was going to be taking part in some sort of uh, events commemorating it. And uh, because he's not an easy interview to get, but he wanted to talk uh, about that. So uh, that's how I was able to, to get the interview. And of course, the wonderful thing about him is that, well, he's he did a movie like a year ago. He's still at it. And he goes back to uh, stuff way before um, True Grit even. Uh, so he's, he's just, he's a wonderful storyteller and very enthusiastic. Mm-hmm. You know, I was watching him in the movie the other night. We watched uh, True, uh, was True Grid, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was one of the leader of the bad guys. And, Ned Pepper. That's a and, lucky Ned Pepper, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you know, like, I was reading his face, you know. This is a guy that he's thinking about. Obviously, he's thinking about the role he's got. And, he, you know, he's playing, playing the part in the movie. But you know, I'm reading him, and I'm thinking, there's a lot more. You can tell right now with this young, young... Duvall, there's a lot to him. Yeah. And of course, we as we've seen his career grow on, we know he's done a lot of stuff. Yeah. Oh yes. Well, you have a um, a quote from him that um, uh, that he said about Lonesome Doves about Lonesome Dove. We're making the Godfather of westerns. Right. I thought that was a wonderful quote for him to have to say. And then, of course, he's kind of famous as Gus McRae. There's a hat. You know, it's called the the Gus, and um, you talk a little bit about how that hat came to be. Do you recall what how that happened? Uh, um, I recall that they had. I think they wanted him to wear some kind of a sombrero. Yes, and and <laughs> I, I think he pretty much was not going to do the movie if that's what was going to happen. Uh, yeah, he. <laughs> He knew what kind of a hat he wanted, and he got it. Yeah, but, I think he uh, showed yeah, them was... some Ranger, Texas Ranger kind of style hats. Right. It's like, no, this is. <laughs> and uh... of course, now, and they wanted. Do, am I? It, I'm asking you, like, yeah. Do I remember my article right? Well, so... uh, but um, because they originally wanted him for Tommy Lee Jones' part. Yes. 
Yes, they wanted him for Woodruff F. Call, and he said in the interview that he gave credit to his um, second wife, who right. said, no, no, no. She had read the book, and, and she really had liked the book because she said, I guess up to that time, Chekhov or Dostoevsky or somebody had been kind of her favorite. Mm -hmm. She really liked Lonesome Dove, and she said, no, this is the part for you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you bring out in the book, Henry, that as movies are made, they don't always end up being as the way they started, and actors change parts, and just like we're talking right now, it's not unusual, and the, the, the actors also influence the scripts, and next thing you know, they're t changing the scenes, and, right. and sometimes you think it's not allowed to happen, but apparently it does. <laughs> Well, yeah. I guess it sort of depends on whether it seems like a good idea and how much power the actors have. It's yeah. funny, two, two actors that I've uh, interviewed separately uh, that whose stories kind of came together, uh, both Earl Holloman uh, and uh, Morgan Woodward, uh, when I talked to them individually about their favorite uh, TV episodes, uh, both came up with the same uh, episode of Gunsmoke that they were in. And the thing was, the way it was originally written, Morgan Woodward was the villain, and Earl Holloman was, was the uh, guy getting victimized, essentially. And uh, they both looked at it and said, wouldn't it be more fun if, you know, Earl was pushing Morgan around? And and they switched parts, and they both and they both did numerous episodes. But both said that was their favorite. Oh, how fun! <laughs> how fun! Well, you uh, since you just mentioned um, Earl Holloman in the next chapters that go forward, you also have the Stars TV, and um, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, you had the Stars TV, but we're gonna skip and get to chapter five: characters, good and bad. Uh -huh. And you said let's start with good, and you had. Um, Holloman as the as the, the the good guy out of the little group. Do you want to? Is there some anything else you'd like to share about him? Uh, gosh, um, I remember Earl telling me uh, about the first time that that he had his name uh, on the screen above the title. Uh, it was for a picture called Trooper Hook. Uh, with him and uh, the stars were Barbara Stanwyck and Joel McRae. And he went to a screening of it uh, in a, probably a theater, you know, in Studio City, uh, although it's now a bookstore. Oh. Um, and uh, he was seeing it with uh, Joel McRae and the titles came up and he hadn't, he hadn't known what was going to happen. And the titles come up and it says, Joel McRae, Barbara Stanwyck, and Earl Holloman in Trooper Hook. And he said, uh, Joel like punched him in the arm and said, look at that, will you? And just like, knocked him out of his seat. He had no idea he was gonna get that bill. <laughs> That's really fun. Um, do you wanna move into the bad? We'll move, I'm looking at time. We're gonna move into the bad because oh. I'd love you to mention a little bit about Bruce Dern. And we have a couple others like Katie. Hager yeah, we, we wanna get to the women if we can. If, you got so, time. if we got time, but we're gonna hit on Bruce Dern. <laughs> well, uh, Bruce Dern is, is, a, is such an entertaining guy, such a talented actor. Um, and it's, it's funny, he, uh, does what he calls Dernsies. I, I forget which actor coined that term, but essentially it's when he starts with what's in the script and does something, uh, you know, takes things completely farther and, and more dangerous. Uh, I think of in the, uh, the Cowboys. You remember the scene where uh, he catches up to one of the, the boys that is helping move the cattle and terrifies him and he's just about drowning him dunking him in the water and so on threatening him to, to kill him if he tells john wayne that they're being followed and that was not in the script that was sub. i mean the threat the dialogue was but the almost drowning him was not in the script that no. was just came out of him and they I, i've talked to several oh he he was so scary and he had so much fun doing that. And John Wayne encouraged him so much. He, he said, 
those kids need to be really scared of you. Mm -hmm. And he, he let him push John Wayne around. So knowing that would intimidate them all the more. Wow. Yeah. So interesting. Um, you do have, the, the book is just to our readers. You, you, even if you think I don't like Westerns, you will change your mind. And so um, you really need to let this book engage you. And if you love Westerns and you think like, oh, I've seen those, I've seen those, you know what? You will come to them like they're a new lost friend that you haven't seen in a while and you'll be refreshed and revived and you just need to have this book. <laughs> right. um, you talk about the women. I know we have like two minutes. Um, you talk about a chapter on women. Um, you want to talk about Mariette Hartley? We probably only have time to chat about her for a minute. Oh, sure. Mariette Hartley is a lovely woman and a uh, really talented actress. And uh, her first film was Ride the High Country, which uh, I know I'm not alone in considering, considering Sam Peckinpah's greatest film. And uh, yeah, she was just sort of, uh, she came there with a, that little sort of pixie cut that she had because she'd been playing Joan of Arc in a play. And they just said, you know, we'll go with that. But uh, she has, has a, a wonderful understanding of film and uh, a, a great, took great pleasure uh, in doing that, that film in particular. Uh, mm -hmm. And just loved uh, working with with Joel McRae and um, uh, oh gosh, oh no, it's okay, and I can't help you. <laughs> no, it, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. <laughs> uh, what are you trying to remember, Marion Hartley? I can go to the chapter real quick. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> No, Let's just, see. That's all right. We're, uh, out on the name we're of going a great actor. Chapter 131. 131. Randolph Scott. Randolph. Oh, there you go. I am blacked there out of Randolph go. Scott. That's okay. It's live. This is live, there. folks. This is live. Is. We don't edit out. You get the real yes. deal when you listen to Rendezvous with a writer. But Randolph Scott <laughs> goes back a long yes, time. Yes, he sure does. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, Nobody today funny. knows who he is. Yeah. I yeah. just talked to... Um, the, the fellow who wrote the script for Blazing Saddles and, you know, you do it for Randolph Scott. You know, you remember that moment? Yep, yep, uh, yep. And I asked him, I said, why was it you do it for Randolph Scott and not Joel McRae? And he said, you know why? Because I learned that hard sounds are, are funny and soft ones are not. Uh, Scott is funnier than McRae. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it? It is. So, Henry, um, are you going to be on a red carpet anywhere soon? Are you going to be out live doing any personal appearances? Well, I'm, I'm going to be in Tombstone on uh, March 8th, I believe it mm -hmm. is, uh, doing a signing. Good. And I'm just, I'm a beginner at this. I'm just starting to set up things. I'm starting to phone people and knock on doors and say, I'd like to come and sign my book at your store. <laughs> they say, they're not selling it. I mean, I've got to talk them into it. Jim has, um, Jim, you probably have time for a quote. Let's, let's see if we can get in here. You know, you talk a little bit about Sam Shepard in the book. And I didn't know that much about him. I knew that he is an actor, but I didn't realize that he had uh, done so much writing and so many plays. And he won yeah. a Pulitzer Prize. Right. But uh, his quote on the West, this notion of the cowboy uh, and of the West and the solitary character, this person who was able to fend for himself in spite of everything else to be self-sufficient, it's a very important thing, which gets more and more lost as we move into the idea of civilization. We don't have that quality anymore. We don't have that way of testing ourselves. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a pretty good quote. There are some pretty fabulous, good. from your interviews, yeah. there are just some fabulous nuggets um, that you bring. And then a little teaching moment for John Wayne, he's kind of a father figure. He's got a young man on one of his sets, and he says, I heard of one young man saying, my dad won't let me have the car on Saturday night. And Wayne says, well, when was the last time you offered the boys the car? And the boy says, well, I haven't. And Wayne says, well, why don't you? Maybe your dad will give it to you. Now I have another piece of advice. When is the last time that you told your father 
that you loved him. And the kid kind of sheepishly dropped his head and he says, that will work too. <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't in a movie that was just john wayne on the set <laughs> That's right. well henry thank you so much for being with us tonight this was just thank great you. fun and we look forward to watching a lot yeah. more westerns starting this evening um next week our guest is returning e joe brown he is back with his second book a cowboy's fortune that is part of a series and uh, that book just released at the end of January. So we're so excited to have Joe back with us. Um, we want to thank all of you that are with us tonight, watching episode 72 mm -hmm. or listening on the podcast. And remember you can hear all our interviews now on your favorite podcast channels like Spotify, just search rendezvous with a writer. And thank you to Sam Hassan and LA Talk Radio and Alex Dormont and the Hot Texas Swing Band. And, and it's always a great day out west. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Henry. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Happy trails. Happy trails. <laughs>